Well, good morning, everybody. Make sure all of my electronics are working here. Had some technical difficulties in class, but I think they're about resolved, maybe. There we go. All right. Sorry for the delays. You're probably wondering why I'm up here. <laughs> um, as you know, I am a student at uh, Tennessee Bible College, and one of the courses that I'm taking this semester or this quarter is Sermon Design and Delivery. One of the assignments is to present three lessons, um, one topical, one textual, and one expository. And so um, I will be presenting a lesson today, a topical lesson, and one more, not really sure when, live, and then we'll record another one to do at a later time. So that, that's what I'm doing up here. I want to join in with everyone else in welcoming you to the Hampton Church of Christ. If you have not uh, filled out one of those cards, uh, please do so, and, and don't forget uh, to st stay behind afterward to let us have a chance to meet with you um, that way we can get to know you a little bit better. Get this tilted just right. I want to begin our lesson looking at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. If you don't mind turning there, it will be on the screen. But I'd like for us to all look at what the Hebrews writer says here. Make sure all the microphones are turned on. The book of Hebrews is about the superiority of Christianity to the law of Moses. I've said that before, but the, the general gist of the arguments as he has made them in the book have been that Jesus is the superior messenger to angels. He is superior to mankind. He is superior to Moses. He's superior to Joshua. He is a superior high priest. He is a superior sacrifice. Now, coming off of the heels of having made the argument that Jesus is the superior sacrifice because it was a one-time sacrifice, he says this, that since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Right there, he hits at what the essence of the problem, what, what the problem was with the law of Moses. It was the blood of bulls and goats. It wasn't possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Jesus Christ offered his superior sacrifice for us. And that's basically the theme of the book of Hebrews, the, the superior sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the superior priesthood. He is trying to encourage his readers not to go back to the law of Moses. And so he gives, this is kind of interesting, now that we've looked at chapter 10, go back to chapter 4. I'd like to look at something else. In his arguments, he's trying to show that Christianity is superior in every conceivable way to the law of Moses. And the argument that he makes in chapter 4 is very interesting because he gives Christianity an interesting designation. His argument here is, consider the concept of rest. If Joshua, he says in verse 8, had given them, that is the, the, the nation of Israel, the generation that finally conquered the land of Canaan, if Joshua had given them rest, he asked this question, God would not have spoken of another day later on, so then there remains a Sabbath rest 
for the people of God. Now, if you have a different version, if you have an older version that just says rest, the actual Greek behind this is sabbatismos. So it is, it is Sabbath rest, and the newer translations reflect that. But that's a rather interesting thing to say, isn't it? For the Hebrews writer to say that, that Christianity is a sabbatismos, it's a Sabbath rest. Why would he say that? What is driving his argument here to make him say that? That's a, that's a, that's a very significant question. And also... Does this not sound strange to us? Those of us who understand that, it, that the, the, um, the law of Moses is no longer binding, there is no Sabbath day anymore. So does this not sound strange to us that he would say that Christianity is itself a sabbatismos? What does that mean? What is the significance of his argument? Why would he say that? We'll come back to that. But I think the answer to this question, why would the Hebrews writer refer to Christianity as a Sabbath rest. I think the answer to that question lies in the message of Sabbath under the Old Testament. In other words, what was it that God was trying to teach Israel through the Sabbaths? And there were many Sabbaths. There was not just the Sabbath day. There were, there were many others. And we'll hit those as we do. But I would like for us to probe that question in, in this morning's lesson. What was the significance of Sabbath for the nation of Israel? And what does that mean for us? And we know that it does mean something for us because Paul, writing to the Colossians, had this to say. He says, and he's arguing with the, uh, the Judaizers in, in Colossae who were trying to tell the, 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 uh, the Gentiles that they needed to observe the law of Moses, circumcision and things like that. And he says, since you've had your sin debt nailed to the cross, you've been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands because you've been baptized, he says, don't let anyone tell you that you have to observe the festivals or the new moons or the Sabbaths. And then he says, why? Don't let anyone tell you that you have to observe these things because these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And what his point, all of these here, the festivals, the new moons, all of these related to the Jewish calendar. And what he's trying to say to them is, don't, don't worry about the, 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 the festivals and the feast days and all of that. Those things find their substance in Christ. So let's do that this morning. I would like for us to explore the idea of Sabbath as it was presented in the Old Testament and just see what God had to say about Sabbath. That way, when we look at it from this perspective, when the Hebrews writer calls Christianity a sabbatismos, a Sabbath rest, and when uh, Paul says that Sabbath finds its substance in Christ, we'll have a better understanding of what those phrases mean. So let's look. Let's see what the Old Testament has to say about Sabbath. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning. The idea of Sabbath is almost as old as the world itself. We're going to look at the archetypal Sabbath the seventh day of creation, and see what Scripture has to say about it. And then we'll look at what the law of Moses has to say about the Sabbath days. We're starting off in Genesis chapter 2, in the first three verses, it says this, The heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So there's the beginning of the idea. From the foundation of the world, we see the idea that, that Sabbath, the seventh day, was significant in some way. Now that meaning doesn't become immediately clear. It, it becomes more clear as Scripture elaborates on the idea. But right here from the very beginning... The idea that the seventh day is set apart for some purpose in God's mind is laid out. Continuing on and looking at what uh, else is said, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, let, let's consider the garden and what the garden represented for man and how God viewed it in his mind. This is right after uh, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And they're hiding themselves from God. But the words that are chosen are very specific and they are, they're chosen on purpose. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
Now, this was, a, this was a futile attempt. You can't hide from the presence of the omnipresent God. But in a, in a Jew's mind, the idea of the presence of God is tied to the temple. The temple was the place where God's presence dwelled. In the, in the most holy place, that was where God's presence was. And the temple was modeled after the garden. The temple was designed to look like the Garden of Eden. If you read through the instructions on how it was to be designed and how it is described in the scriptures with, with palm trees and, and almonds and all of that, it was designed to look like the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was the archetype for the temple, the presence of God. And so Adam and Eve are trying to hide from the presence of God. It's a very significant thought, at least in a, in a Jew's mind. You can't really hide from his presence, but they attempted to do so. Let's look at another idea here. This is from Genesis chapter 3. What were, what were the consequences? For violating God's law, you can eat any of the, of the fruit from any tree here in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat from that tree, and the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But they did. And here's the punishment. And this is uh, focusing on Adam. This also applied to Eve as well. But to, uh, to Adam, God says here, Genesis three seventeen through 19, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So, the garden, it was the place where God's presence dwelt. And it was a place where man was, and man was certainly given the command to dress and keep the garden, but he did not have to toil as this curse placed upon him. It was a place of rest. It was a place where the presence of God was enjoyed. It was a place of peace with God. It was a place of peace with, with man. Had, had there been other men, he would have been at peace with them. But he lost peace with God. Man, man did. He lost peace with God. He lost access to God. And he lost rest. How terrible it must have been for them to be cast out of the garden. I just wonder, you know, you, you can't really know these things, but I just wonder what was going through their mind when, when it started to dawn on them what had been lost in the garden. It's just interesting to think about sometimes. Now, in connection with that, we have 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. The problem that was introduced in the garden is resolved in Christ. Man was cast from the presence of God, and the law of Moses didn't solve that problem. The patriarchal system, whatever that was, we don't know a whole lot about it, but whatever it was, it didn't solve the problem. Man was still uh, outside the presence of God under both of those systems. But the message of Christianity is reconciliation. We can enjoy reconciliation with God in Christ, not in something else, in Christ. And Paul, making that general argument here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. That's a reversal of the problem presented in the garden. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us, and that would be the Paul and the apostles, the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. What was introduced in the Garden of Eden was spiritual death. I've said before in several classes that that's what spiritual death is. Spiritual death is being cast from the presence of God and being invited back into the presence of God. That is what spiritual resurrection is. It is life from death. And that's what Christianity offers us. The whole Bible story from Genesis to the maps is restoring the relationship that man used to have in Christ. That separation is undone by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
And so it's worth thinking about. When we, uh, when we preach the gospel out in the world, we are preaching the gospel of reconciliation. Just as the apostles were, even though we're not apostles, we are preaching to them, we implore you, be reconciled to God. And so, what does, what does Sabbath, the seventh day of creation, what does that teach us? It teaches us that God desires a relationship with us, but sin separates us from him. It separates us from the rest that we can enjoy in him. And it separates us from the communion that we can enjoy with him. So there's the, there's the stage set. Sabbath is introduced through the seventh day of creation. And then it is integrated later into the law of Moses. I actually want to add one more, fi- one more thought to this. In Hebrews 4, 8 through 10, verse 10 says, Whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. In other words, there was a connection to the day of creation, or the seventh day of creation that the Hebrews writer makes there to show that he intends for them to think back on that day. He'd actually introduced that idea previously in, uh, in a few verses before. Now, Building on that idea of of, uh, drawing near to God, the Hebrews writer explicitly says that we can draw near to God in Christ. We do not have, this is Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near. Now that phrase draw near for a Jew was a very specific phrase with worship connotations. In fact, I think the phrase is used seven times in the book of Hebrews, and almost every time it's talking about us being able to draw near to God in worship. So the, his argument is that drawing near to God and in, into his presence is possible in Christ. Uh, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, what does Sabbath say? What, is the, what did the seventh day of creation say about God? God created the world in six days. He rested on the seventh. As a sign, uh, he had finished creation. Man enjoyed rest and peace with God in the garden until he sinned. As a result, he was banished from God's presence. The Hebrews writer says Christianity is the rest toward which God was pointing. When he rested from creation. In Christ, man may draw near to God and enjoy rest in his divine presence. That's the message behind the seventh day of creation. And I said earlier that this is integrated into the law of Moses. The law of Moses adds layers to the teaching that is Sabbath. So let's look at that. What does the law of Moses have to say about Sabbath? There were a lot of different Sabbaths under the law of Moses. We think about the Sabbath day, but there was also the Sabbath year. There was the year of Jubilee. Most of the feast days were Sabbaths, except for, I think, uh, Passover and the Feast of First Fruits. I think those were the only ones that weren't Sabbaths, but all of the rest of them were. Holy convocations, in them you shall do no regular labor. So the Sabbath drove everything that Israel did in a religious context. It's not just one day of the week. It's, uh, it's an entire matrix of ideas attached to all these feast days and, and, and all of this stuff. So... First off, let's look at Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Familiar passage. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, uh, to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no, uh, not do any work, you or your sons or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. And here's why. He says, Honor the Sabbath day. Here's my reason why. And in this place, he attaches it to the creation account. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So we already have a connection. The law of Moses is tied to, or excuse me, the Sabbath day is tied to the creation rest. But it doesn't stop there. He actually ties this to several other ideas. Let's look now at what he has to say about it from Deuteronomy chapter 5. 
I'm actually skipping over a, a little bit of elaboration in the middle here. So uh, just uh, keep that in mind. We're trying to hit the highlights. In this place, he says, Observe the Sabbath to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Now, instead of attaching it to the seventh day of creation, here he says, I want you to observe the Sabbath to remember that you came out of Egyptian bondage. That seems on the surface to be somewhat different. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. The Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So, redemption, being saved by God from bondage, is now tied to the idea of Sabbath. It's not just rest as God rested from his labors. It's also rest from the labors that you uh, suffered under when you were in bondage. Now, one of the uh, more interesting ones here, Exodus 31, 12 through 15. What happened if you didn't observe the Sabbath? Some of the other laws, if you broke those, you were fined for it. But the penalty for failing to observe the Sabbath was very severe. It says here, now this is, uh, this is applying to individuals. It says in Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 through 15, The Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, most important. Why? Why? Why is this most important? Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. What was so significant about the Sabbath that this is the penalty for violating it? Uh, keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. That's rather severe. But the answer is right here in the verse. He says, the reason I have told you to observe the Sabbath, above all, observe the Sabbath because I have set you apart. Sanctification is the key in this verse. Because Israel had been set aside as God's uh, people, because they had been set aside, he says, you will observe this Sabbath because if you don't, The penalty is death. I have set you aside, so you will observe this Sabbath. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. That's rather severe. Notice this. This is a little bit more of that. Uh, Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. That's interesting. He ties in the concept of sanctification with the seventh day of creation. So all of these ideas swirl together. They, 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 They build up the idea of Sabbath. It's not just this one thing. You rest because God did on the seventh day. It's not just that. It's you rest because God rested from his labors on the seventh day. You rest because I have brought you out of slavery in in Egypt. And you rest because I have set you apart. That's the salvation story right there. Sabbath taught Israel the idea of redemption from bondage and being set apart for God. It gives a lot of weight to what the Hebrews writer is saying in Hebrews chapter 4, which we will revisit a little bit later on. But those are all the ideas that are being built up in Sabbath. Now, um, in case Israel missed it, and of course they did, the Sabbath was not the main goal. It wasn't, remember the Sabbath day because I created the world in seven days, I brought you out of Egypt, and I sanctified you. There was something else that they were to look forward to. Now, this is a fairly popular passage, well-known passage, that refers to um, the, the church. 
It's also in Isaiah chapter 2. This is verbatim from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2 as well. But I wanted to include this one because it references rest. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. And it shall be lifted up above the hills and peoples shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the, of the God of Jacob that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. As I said, this is a very well-known passage that prophesied about the coming of the kingdom. Other passages in Isaiah and and other places will refer to this as a place of the beating of of swords into plowshares, uh, the, the lying down of wolves with lambs. It's all talking about the peace that you and I enjoy in Christ. Whether it's a clean animal, an unclean animal, they are all at peace with each other. And so, he, this, this is about the kingdom, but he ties this in with it. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, there's that, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. That's a well-known phrase in Jewish thinking to refer to rest. Instead of constant battling, this is spiritual application in the New Testament, obviously. There was a literal application for this under the old law. But under the law of Moses, the kingdom had to be preserved with literal warfare. In Christ, it is spiritual warfare that we wage. We don't go to battle with with literal swords or guns or anything like that. We destroy, as Paul says, arguments against Christ. That's a summary of what he said. But we enjoy peace in Christ. And Israel was told in their Old Testament prophecies that they should look forward to a kingdom of peace and rest. It wasn't that the Sabbath was not it. And that's the, that's the general flow of the argument in Hebrews chapter 4. Remember that he said... If Joshua had given Israel rest, why then did God speak of another later on? He's actually referring to this next verse. I think that's what my next verse is. Yes. In Psalm 3 and 4, he quotes extensively from, or in uh, in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, he quotes extensively from Psalm 95. We'll start here in verse 7 where he does and then look at it. Okay, to set the stage for what's going on here, Israel finally went into the land of promise. They, they, they conquered the land of Canaan with Joshua as their commander. Okay, so the land rest was achieved under Joshua. And there, excuse me, there they were commanded to observe the feast days and the Sabbaths, etc. But that wasn't the end. In fact, this is what, this is what David says. David, this, he's writing hundreds of years after Israel was already in the land. David says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test, that's the essence of those words, and put me to, uh, to the proof, though they had seen my work for 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." So what David is saying here is saying, just as Israel failed to enter into the land of Canaan, that generation, because of their unbelief, David says, today, don't harden your hearts like they did. There is still a risk of failing to enter the rest that God has waiting. And so a a Jew sensitive to spiritual things would read this and say, well, wait a minute. We've got the feast days. We've got the Sabbaths. Uh, we've got the, the land. We are at rest in the land and we have the law. I mean, what, what else is there? What, is, what else is there for David to say, don't, don't run the risk of failing to enter into God's rest? And so the Hebrews writer said, there remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. And what his argument was is Jesus is, Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus is superior to the angels as a messenger. He is superior to mankind. He is superior to Moses as a lawgiver. He is superior to Joshua. So the nation of Israel, they were destroyed. 
because they failed to keep the Sabbaths. And for, for those of us who fail to enter into the rest that God has provided for us in Christ, the same is true. Individuals and corporate. An entire congregation can, if God deems it necessary, be cut off from him, their, their lampstand uh, stuffed out, if they fail to observe the rest that God had provided for them. And so, uh, let's see, I have that one already. As a summary to this section, through the Sabbath, God taught Israel that rest from physical labor and physical bondage could only be found in a covenant with Christ. Come out of bondage, be sanctified as my people. But there was no real rest under the law of Moses. The Hebrews writer makes that point in Hebrews chapter 10. If you, you went to the Day of Atonement, and you were there for the, the ritual observances of the Day of Atonement, but as soon as the Day of Atonement was over, you got to do the whole thing again next year. It didn't actually solve the problem. There is a reminder of sins every year. That's why the Hebrews writer makes that point in chapter 9 that Jesus Christ is the one time. He went into the most holy place, the, the real holy place, and offered his blood one time for all time. And so, there was no true rest under the law of Moses, but Jesus offers man true, ultimate rest, which the Hebrews writer refers to as sabbatismos, Sabbath rest. Jesus offers man true rest from attempting to merit favor with God, that was the problem that the Jews uh, had with the law of Moses. They, they corrupted it in, from these are the commands that God gave us to teach us spiritual truths about the coming of the Messiah to we can earn God's favor by doing these things. Let's see if we can make it better. And they ended up corrupting it, seeking to establish their own righteousness. They did not submit to the righteousness of God. And so Christ provides us true rest. There is true rest in the kingdom of Christ. Uh, Christ also frees us from our bondage to sin. Just as Israel was taken out of Egyptian bondage and sanctified as God's people, we too, when we are immersed into Christ, are taken out of our bondage to sin and sanctified by the Spirit of God in the church of Jesus Christ. That's what the essence of Sabbath is. It is the idea of redemption. And so, uh-oh, I went ahead too far. My, my flow is messed up. There we go. The Sabbath. It is, it's, well, it's, it's, it's a radically different concept in the New Testament from the way it is presented in the Old. That's one of the reasons I think we've had some, some trouble with it. The Sabbath is, it was a day under the law of Moses. But that's not what it is in Christianity. The Sabbath is not a day for us today. Sabbath rest. What Christ intended for us is not a day when you don't go to work. It's not even a day when you do go to church services. Some people refer to, to Sunday as the Christian Sabbath. Uh, some, you know, there's no, there's no uh, support for that in Scripture. It misses the point. Saying that it was a day under the law of Moses and it, it's a day to, today misses the point. It was, it's not a day when we don't go to work. It's not a day when we do go to church services. It is the state of being that we enjoy because we are connected to each other in the body of Christ. And that's what we learn from Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath teaches us about the type of relationship that we should enjoy with God. It is the message of communion with God. It is the message of reconciliation with God. And that's the message that I would like to leave with everyone here today. If someone is not in the body of Christ, then the way into Christ is the plan of salvation. I think we're fairly familiar with it, but in case you're not, it is to hear the gospel and believe it. To confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, to repent of your sins, and to be immersed into Christ for the remission of those sins, and to live faithfully to that charge, even if it costs us our life. Revelation 10, it, it, it would cost some of those original readers of Revelation their life for choosing to obey Christ. But if we are faithful to God, then he has promised us rest. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, Come to me, all you who labor 
and are heavenly burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, because I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He was speaking of the fulfillment of Sabbath. Sabbath finds its rest in him, and we find our rest in him. If you have a need to respond to the gospel invitation, please come as we sing the invitation song.